Hey there, this will be kind of quick. Uh, I'm doing okay. Just uh, have been waiting on the Lord. With the Ephesians thing, I I can only do that if he gives me a release to do it. And um, it seems like I'm doing it in little bite-sized chunks. Plus, people are sharing my videos a lot. And it's like, uh, there's only so much you can take. <laughs> only so much David Benjamin that needs to be out there at any given time. Um we are uh, happy to know that our sister, uh, you know, the Lord has kept her and she can see uh, that, you know, that she wasn't going on a healthy path. And we pray that she gets help. Um, you know, unfortunately, we were all blocked, so we have no way to reach out to her or anything like that. But I know the Lord will line her up with the resources she needs to get into a healthier place. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but, you know, as in my view, uh, you know, that we were just thrown for a loop and we all process things differently. And maybe that's one of the reasons I've been silent for two weeks because it just blew me away. Uh, stuff like that really hurts. And to see a little resurrection, to go, okay, Jesus, the testimony is there, you know. It may have been covered for a bit. Um, and there was evidence that, man, wh what does this person believe? And where are they getting all this stuff? You know, some old things coming out. But praise God, uh, he doesn't lose any of us. And we need to see that kind of thing. You know, we really do. All of us um, need that kind of encouragement. Uh, there's nothing scarier than apostasy. There was a guy in the in the early church called Julian the Apostate. People had a reputation. I mean, if they were someone who was ardently a defender of the gospel and then turned and repudiated it all, it brought so much misery to the church because it literally shakes your confidence. You know, it's like, man, how could this happen? Well, again, there's two ways it can happen. Either someone has a breakdown and flirts with the idea of repudiating everything and, and can go so far as to say some things you're like, wow, you know. Or they're crept in unaware and they never believed in the first place. You cannot say that someone has lost their salvation. It's not possible. Um, salvation is Christ himself. And he gives himself fully, not in part. And anyone who receives him uh, has him. Who has the son has the life, right? But we know each other by the testimony. The only thing I have to go on is what you say. You know, you could be the nicest person, but if you've got Jesus wrong, you're not my brother. If you've got a different Jesus or you don't have the right gospel, we're not in fellowship. It's not possible. We can be nice. We can be cordial. I can play in a band with you. You know, I play in bands with people who have totally different beliefs about Jesus. Uh, they're not my brothers, you know, but we can't fellowship that deep calling to deep, that spiritual enjoyment of Christ is not there. Um, and also we can't listen to them teach about Christ, you know, so it, it was a tough little journey and luckily it only has been a couple of weeks, you know, but, um, like I said, praise God. I mean, it seems like, uh, this person's coming to their senses spiritually. They may never talk to us again. That's not really what we're worried about. Um, seriously. Uh, although, I can tell you a bunch of people miss her greatly. Uh, anyway, the reason I'm on here is because I got an email from someone who uh, pretty often is getting clearer and clearer about justification by faith and the ground we stand on. But they pretty often run into various kinds of wolves and Calvinists who say things that really throw them for a loop. And then when they read the scriptures, it throws them for a loop. Um, it seems like they're good for a little bit, and then they read some Bible verse that seems to indicate that you have to repent of all your sins, <laughs> or you're not going to be saved. 
Uh, you're gonna have the right attitude about sin to be saved. And how much do you? How how much is repenting of all? Well, it's all, you know. And it puts this person in fear. And they said, um, they sent me another question, and I'm like, look, you know, only the Lord is gonna be able to teach you, because because they were like, uh, well, how, how does this line up with our beliefs? You know, I'm like, no, it can't be our beliefs. This is not about a group of people and what they believe. This is about what you believe. And until you're firmly convinced from the Lord himself and in the word, you don't have it. It's not just, I'm going to go hang out with that group of people that believes this and call those beliefs my beliefs. Because they're not your beliefs until you're standing on them to the point where no one can turn you upside down, you know, we're growing and that's individual growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, growing in the faith. We can encourage each other and point each other to him and to the word and explain scriptures. But until you see it, that's just Dave's explanation or that group's explanation. That's their beliefs. Or you might say that's our beliefs, but if you're, if it, you're getting overturned every time you encounter something different and you think it's this group of people versus that group of people, and they didn't really say it like that. I'm kind of extrapolating in a more general way for lots of people that I see this trend. And that, you know, that's why there will be people who come along with us for quite a while and then a doctrinal controversy will come up where the gospel has to be contended for and people have to separate and they don't see why they just think we're being mean well that shows me that they're just standing around a group of people that have beliefs but those are not their beliefs you know um they don't see a distinction um so really we have to own this and that's maybe another reason why i'm not teaching as much is because it's like Man, you know, somebody needs to get, everybody needs to get in the word now and confirm it. You might like the way I say things and you might be able to repeat what I say, but do you believe it or are you just affiliated, you know, with a group? The, the, the internet could break down tomorrow and then there's no more groups. And what you've got is you and the word, and you've got to be able to see these things in the word. If you're listening to messages and comforted, but then when you go to the word, you see something different, that's a problem uh, that should cause you to ask, what's wrong with the teacher or what's wrong with me? And, you know, this is one of the reasons why Christians don't grow is because week after week they go to the church, institutional church, and they listen to a pastor juggling scriptures out of context and applying them to whatever he thinks they mean. And then when they go read the Bible at home, they can't see it. They can't see how he arrived at that. Now, usually it's because the teaching is bad. But you know what they do? They shut down and they say, well, I'm not a pastor. And he has an understanding. He went to college and seminary and has years and he's very mature spiritually so i just need to trust him and that's what they're told well the only way to survive being in a church where what the pastor is preaching from the bible is something that you can't see when you read the bible the only way to survive that is to not read the bible or leave there's no otherwise you're going to get in trouble you know so we need to be reading the Bible and we need to make sure that we can see in the Bible the things that we're hearing that we like, that we think is food. Otherwise, it's not ours, you know, even if you can repeat it. Um, and again, you know, there are people who call us a cult. And one of the reasons is because people pick up a language. There's a lingo, you know, that that when you investigate a little further, you realize they don't know what they're talking about. They cannot, um, they can't defend these points they're making. They're just repeating David Benjamin. 
And that is not healthy if that's going on. And I know it is in some places, you know. Um, only the Lord knows who's just, you know, repeating what somebody else is saying. And so who really has touched that in the word. And I don't want to scare anybody, you know, but, um, and make you think, oh my gosh, well, what if I haven't really touched it? No, it's not, I'm not talking about something mystical. I'm just saying, you listen to a message like one that Nolan shared a couple of my messages today. One is not I, but Christ. You listen to that message. If you go re- and you go, yeah, that's so good. You know, then you go read the Bible. Do you see the same thing? You know, or do you come away going, man, I didn't see that at all. And, and, you know, it comes down to knowing where you're standing, how to, how to divide the word, because you can go to any place in the scripture and see anything you want. If you're looking at yourself, you're going to see a lot more of yourself. You're going to see the law. You're going to see condemnation. You're going to see alienation from God. You're going to see performance required. But if you're looking at Christ and the gospel, which describes him, you're going to see that he has all the responsibility. But anyway, um, there is a practical tip because because she was like this person who emailed me was like, you know, and I'm just talking. So this is not an eloquent teaching. I'm just speaking. Uh, she was like, uh, you know, how do I want to make sure I can be like you? in terms of seeing what you see because i had told her look don't don't call it our beliefs you got to know if you believe these things you might end up believing something else which is fine you know but you've got to you got to know what you believe and they're like no i i believe but i want it to be my beliefs and i want to be i want to know where to see it in the word you know um Because they're going around to different scriptures and different people and seeing different things. And so practically, I told her, and this is why I wanted to make the video. Look, I read Romans and Galatians almost exclusively for six to seven years. Uh, And I used to feel guilty for not getting out of Romans and not reading other parts of the Bible. You know, why am I not in Jeremiah? Why am I not in Proverbs? Why am I not in the Gospels? Why am I only in Romans and Galatians? And I kind of explained uh, what Romans has, especially chapters 3 through 5. Uh, chapter Romans 3 shows us that, yes, whether we're Gentiles apart from the law, before the law, or whether we're Jews under the law, we're all condemned and we're all guilty before God. There's none that's done good, none righteous, none that seeks God. Not even one. Not even one. And so as far as our righteousness is concerned, we are condemned. There is no righteousness. None does good. So that pretty much puts the uh, nail on the coffin for the human race, right? If it's, if it's, how do you, how do you get justified before God? Well, seek God, seek, uh, seek glory and, and pursue doing good. Then you'll have glory. Well, none does good. None seeks God. That's already out. God's already condemned us. Um, it, when he condemns something, he's not asking you to try. He's asking you to believe what he has said, believe his judgment, and this is the judgment of the law. But Romans 3 tells us that the righteousness of God, which the law witnessed to, was manifested apart from the law in the person of Christ. Christ is the manifestation of the righteousness of God. Not the righteousness of me doing better, but the righteousness of God himself manifested on everyone who believes. Everyone who believes the gospel, the righteousness of God, which is Christ himself, is manifested on them. And God is vindicated in justifying them and forgiving their sins. And they obtain a standing before God in his grace, apart from the law. And then Romans 4 tells us, again, whether it's 
Abraham without the law or David under the law, it is not him who works, but him who believes that is justified. And specifically to him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. What righteousness? We already described it. It's the righteousness of God manifested in Christ. It's Christ as God's righteousness that is manifested on me in faith. When I believe, when I work not, but I believe on him who justifies the ungodly. Now, to work not means I do no good thing. I do nothing good. I can't be justified by works. And not only that, but the law told me that I can't. I didn't do any works. There's none who does good. So that's me. That's the judgment on me. And yet, there's a righteousness of God manifested apart from the law, which is Christ himself. And he's been set forth to satisfy all the claims uh, and to clear me, right? And justification means that that righteousness is given to me as a free gift. We see that in Romans 5. But Romans 4 says, it's for him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is gone to him as righteousness. And then it says, even as David described the blessedness of the man to whom God will not impute sin. And blessed is he whose sins are forgiven. My sins are forgiven and God's not imputing them to me. Meaning there is no account. There's no judgment. There's no record of my sins. It's been expunged. And... I'm an heir, like Abraham. I'm to inherit the world to come and the promise is sure to all the seed. So both forgiveness of sins and right standing before God and peace with God and the blessing of the gospel, which is the inheritance and the enjoyment of it, is secured to me because God has given Christ to me as my righteousness. Simply by believing apart from any works. And then Romans 5 shows us that it was while we were yet sinners, while we were weak, while we were ungodly, and while we were enemies of God, that God reconciled us to himself and commended his love to us. By, by When it says he commended to his love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, it means that God pointed to Christ and recommended and extolled Christ on the cross as the token of his love for us. He spoke to us and said, I love you. When? While we were yet sinners, while we were weak, while we were ungodly, while we were not doing good, while we worked not, while we were enemies of God, right? He commended his love towards us in the cross. That was God speaking about sin, and about righteousness, and about how to have peace with God, and how he, only he could bring us to himself, and only he could qualify us. Um, and so I spent, I mean, there's so much more, but I spent, that's just a little summary I gave her. I spent six years in those chapters, and then Romans uh, 6 through 8. Just, I couldn't get out of it. And Galatians as well. And here's the problem. Those are six chapters in Romans that, and, and, four, and six chapters in Galatians that really are the root of what I'm standing on, okay? Now, you compare those 12 chapters against the whole rest of the Bible, and the problem is, is we think, well, that's an insignificant portion of the Bible, <laughs> Why? Because, and this goes to what we were talking about in Ephesians, we don't appreciate Paul's ministry. We don't understand the significance. That's why I always say that right division of the word and really entering into grace means you have to see Paul's ministry and understand the authority that he held and what had been given to him by the ascended Christ. Uh, Paul's book of Romans is really the first coherent full presentation of the gospel with all the defense defensive arguments uh, 
laid out against everything that could assail the conscience. It's the first in the scripture. You can read the Gospels and not see that. Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're not going to see that kind of arguing uh, for just for God's righteousness manifested in Christ. Paul was given like almost an attorney to be an advocate for the righteousness of God manifested in Christ in the way he propitiates sins and deals with them against all the accusation from the devil, from the world, and from the law. You know, the devil says God's not righteous. He can't forgive you. If he's righteous, he's got to condemn you. And the world says, you know, uh, I can't approach God. I'm just full of, I don't know God at all. You know, I, I've never sought him. And the law says, yeah, not only can you not approach, but if you did, you'd be consumed. The wrath is there because of your transgressions. And Paul has to argue against it all. He was set forth by Christ to do that. There's not another. Romans is the first place in the scripture that we see it presented so clearly. And so it's that big of a deal. You know, Paul, the, the epistle of Romans is arguing against the legalistic interpretation of the entire rest of the Bible. <laughs> and it's called Paul's gospel. Romans is the gospel of Paul. He started in Romans 1 where he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, for in it is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith. In the gospel, the righteousness is... See, the law pointed to the righteousness, but the righteousness is actually revealed in the gospel, which presents the Son of God and his person and his work. And that was in Romans 1.16. And then for the rest of the next, you know, 10 chapters, Paul is speaking forth his gospel, which would have sounded totally different than anything you would have heard almost at that time. And yet it's all based on the word, but it's based on the understanding that God gave him in Christ and the revelation of the mystery of Christ in us and the clear present truth based on the fact that Christ has now accomplished the work. And so we can speak to it really clearly. So Romans is that significant. If you're in Romans for six years or seven years and you can't get out of it, that's nothing. That's a drop in the hat. Abraham didn't have a Bible. You know, he, he took 13, 20, 30 years to go through a le one or two lessons from God. God deals with us in decades, and skimming over the surface of a book is not the way to get it. You know, reading a little Psalms, reading a little Proverbs, reading a little Genesis, reading a little Jeremiah, and then a couple verses from Romans, that's how most people read their Bible. And no wonder they're confused. There's no systematic approach. You know, Paul's, Paul's writing is really the systematic approach to the Bible. You say, how do I study the Bible? Read Paul. Paul is the teacher. <laughs> and then, as you get solid in Romans and Galatians particularly, you know, any major actual revival has happened. Either evangelical revival or the Protestant Reformation, the Great Awakening, uh, the overthrowing of the Catholic Church and its, its uh, abuses and everything, all came from the recovery of the widespread dissemination of books about Romans and Galatians. Everybody had Luther's commentary at Galatians. Um, it was those two books that turned Europe upside down. And, and, and in our Christian life, it's true. Any person that I've ever read in church history that has actually ministered grace to me has done so because they've gotten clear from Romans and Galatians. It's that big of a deal. Um, and so I say, you know, don't think that just because it's six chapters or 12 chapters and that, you know, there's the rest of the Bible I have to answer for, it's not all on equal footing. You know, some people say you're exalting Paul 
above Christ. No. Paul's ministry is the continuation of Christ's ministry from the heavens after he sat down at the right hand of God and now he reveals a new body of truth called the dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles uh, to make known the revelation of the mystery, right? What, uh, and Ephesians touches the peaks, but the arguments for how do I know how to read the Bible and not be condemned come from Romans and Galatians. Once you start to understand everything in its proper place, when you see Paul, Paul grounds us in showing us how Abraham was justified and what that justification consisted of, not just the forgiveness of sins, but also the inheritance and the blessing. And we know that blessing is the spirit today from Galatians 3. And that we see that our relationship to that blessing is not because we're related to Abraham, but because we believe in Christ, who is the seed to whom the promise was made, and we've been baptized into him, we are one with him, we've put him on. And now Christ is our relationship to everything, including all the promises. And it's based on, and that's what righteousness is. Righteousness is not you doing better or doing the right thing. Righteousness is Christ uh, and his standing on based on his righteousness and who he is as the son of God to inherit all the promises and all the blessings. And he does that on our behalf and brings us in as co-heirs with him, not because of anything we've done, but be, but by faith, because that righteousness is given to us again as a free gift. And it's one we can't work for. It's either a wage for work or a gift. You know, and Romans 5 is making that clear. But these things, I'm just speaking right now strictly from what's in Galatians 3 and Romans 3 through 8. Uh, 3 through 8, really, but 3 through 5. And I told her, please forget everything and memorize those books. <laughs> Make outlines of those books, the major points. Keep reading those books until you know from chapter to chapter, what point is next and what point the what he's building on in chapter three is building on from chapter one, you know, see the connection throughout the book. You got nothing better to do. You're going to read the Bible anyway. You know, most people read the Bible as a random collection of thoughts from various places at various times. And they try to find something that, quote, ministers to them and today they felt like god showed them i know the plans i have for you plans of prosperity to give you a future and a hope and yesterday he he seemed to say you know that he will anoint me and not let my enemies triumph over me and then and from the psalms and then maybe the day before that from the proverbs i realized that my tongue is unruly and I'm a fool because I use it to speak ill of someone. And you think God's showing you all these things. Oh, God's dealing with me, all these things. No, <laughs> I hate to say it. That is the most, that's what most Christians, that's their Christian life. What they're doing is being tossed to and fro with winds, with no central point with no coherent speaking from God. Uh, and believe me, I know I've been there. You know, it produces nothing but confusion. It's just a mixture. And then when you hear the message of grace, you say, yeah, I can see that. I believe that too, because that's in the Bible too. But you don't see that as the authority that trumps everything else. You hold the view of grace along with all these other contradictory things that you think God's dealing with you about. No, grace is God dealing with you in Christ, because of Christ, for his sake, and only through him. And, and, and we don't believe that. We still think our flesh is going to earn something, obtain something, uh, come up with something some way, and we pursue everything but Christ himself. But Romans and Galatians, and then Philippians, and Colossians and Ephesians, 
and Hebrews, you know, these books eventually argue you out of the old man <laughs> and argue you into the spirit because it's the apostle Paul as an ambassador of Christ beseeching you, begging you based on the mercies of God to be reconciled to God. God's already done everything, but in our mind, we need to be reconciled to the truth. And the, 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 you know, people say, put on your armor. If you have not made a thorough immersing of yourself in Romans and Galatians, you don't have the armor on. I mean, you might have, you might be able to say the name of Jesus, but you don't have anything to keep you from being just absolutely tormented every time you read the Bible or hear a Christian speak. <laughs> you know, you can listen to my messages all you want, but if you haven't seen these things, they're not yours. And you may listen to me and then go listen to another channel that says something completely different and not see a problem. You know, and, and that's evident because so many people get mad when we say, I can't listen to that person anymore. They're not, they're speaking against the gospel or they're, they're speaking something contrary to the truth. Uh, you don't know that it's the truth until you've seen it in the word. At this point, many people are just taking my word for it, you know. Um, and of course, I've gone through Galatians twice and Romans once on this channel and the playlists are there, but even... Forget that. Read those books. And it, and if you have questions for God, instead of asking God to make you a different person, make me more peaceful, make me more this and that, you know, help me with this and help me with that. Ask God to help you understand what Paul's saying in Romans. <laughs> and don't give up until you understand it. And if there's parts of it that make you confused today, don't feel satisfied until you're clear. Because if you can be, if you can clearly follow the thought from Romans 1 all the way through chapter 8, and then also Galatians 1 through 6, if you can understand what Paul's saying, because those are two big, gigantic arguments for God on your behalf to persuade you that it's entirely Christ and none of you, and to get you standing solidly on the basis of Christ's work and not your flesh. If you can understand those th books, really, you'll never be, you, no one will be able to deceive you. No one will take your crown. No one will carry you off as spoil. No one will be able to upset your faith. You won't think you're being attacked by demons. You won't think you're being judged by God. You won't <laughs> think all the terrible things that most Christians go through their life thinking. And it's because of a lack of knowledge of Paul's gospel, which is the same gospel that Jesus um, revealed to the apostles. But Paul was given the task of teaching it doctrinally and contending for it and defeating the opposition that we all have in our mind. He was actually given this, the word like a sword to cut through all the different arguments. And when you see, when you really get into the arguments of what Romans, and you don't even have to look at it as an argument. You don't know it's an argument while you're reading it. Just enjoy it. But he's arguing, <laughs> And he anticipates every possible argument against the gospel in those chapters. Every possible thing that I've ever seen that has come against the truth and brought me into bondage has been solved as I've come to understand Galatians 1 through 6 and Romans 1 through 8. Every single one. Especially Romans 4. The cult I was in. A, a thorough understanding of Romans 4, I could have never been brought into the idea that I may not inherit, uh, I may be saved, but not actually have an inheritance and be in the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing my teeth during the millennium, not blessed. <laughs> uh, I couldn't, if understanding Galatians 3 and Romans 4 solves that for me. And 
I could never have been in the charismatic circles feeling like maybe my finances are cursed because I'm not giving enough. And that's why we're poor. Uh, if I'd have thoroughly understood Galatians 3 and Romans 4. I, I mean, those two chapters alone solved most of the problems in my Christian life, doctrinally. So, yes, we're talking about a small portion of the Bible, uh, but it's the key. If you want to say the key of David, <laughs> it's Paul's gospel concerning Christ, who is the seed of David according to the flesh, and the seed of Abraham, but the Son of God. And uh, his person and his work. That is the key to opening up the rest of the Bible. Now, when I read the Bible, it really doesn't, I don't, I don't stumble over any passages anymore that make me afraid like I used to. Why? Is it because I'm so spiritual and because I've grown so much and I'm more mature now and, I, and I've gone through all these different situations? Nope. It's really, I, I'm, I can trace the root to my understanding of Romans 1 through 8 and Galatians, especially chapter 3 and especially chapter Romans, Romans chapter 4. So this is my advice. That's what I told her, and that's what I'm telling you guys. You can believe me or not, but I sh I strongly encourage you. Um, if you want to read a good commentary on Romans, and I've got one, but uh, <laughs> that I made into a book, but William Newell, William Newell dealt with it masterfully. It's a little dense though. Romans is tough reading in in one sense. But don't think that you got to have this all solved by next week because there's going to be a homework assignment on it. No. Live in Romans. Every time you read the Bible, go to the place where you find food. Uh, okay, this is specifically not targeted to everybody. I'm not mandating that everybody read Romans and Galatians. But if you're struggling with uh, vacillating in your embrace of the gospel, you need to be there. Seriously. Okay, I'm going to let this go, and uh, have a good evening.